This seminar is about canopy plan form, sort of. Um, we, the reason is because we use canopy plan form names as ways to classify canopies in terms of this is for beginners, this is for uh, experts, this is not for you, this is for me. And it works, but uh, there are limits to that uh, because it's not the only thing that defines performance. So let's just jump right into it. First off, why this? Um, we know what elliptical, semi-elliptical means, don't we? We're at least the ones that have been around for a while. We know the characteristics. Isn't this helpful and obvious? Well, yeah, it is. It's been changing over the years, and I will date myself. I started in the 70s. Uh, I was starting on a modified round, meaning they cut a big hole in the back. They had names for all those holes. And then later on, if, if you had advanced to the point where you could jump a para commander, that was now a high performance round, two classes. Square parachutes were something a few people had that were you know, crazy and thousands of jumps or whatever. But it kept changing as I kept jumping, and I couldn't afford to jump much. I was in high school. And uh, you know, there was always some way of saying, this is for you, this is not for you, based on some sort of generic concept, seven cell or nine cell. We used to think of nine cells as training wheels, because then when you were experienced, you got off the manta and you got onto some cool smaller canopy that was seven cells, and that lasted for a few years. And rectangular and elliptical, ZPF 111. It was always, this is for you, this is not for you, and then you were supposed to do this. It's getting complicated, though, because there's the, the, the whole semi-elliptical and all these other terms, and then you've got cross brace cells and conventional ones, and then all these people who are instructors, riggers, and manufacturers have all these different ideas of what's right for you, but you still have to decide. So I believe it's worked generally, but I just want to show that it has evolved and it probably will continue to evolve. So I just want to discuss a few things about the, maybe the, the strengths and the limits of using these, these terms that imply a canopy plan form. So the reason is because I've been delving with all kinds of parachute design for several decades, and my head is kind of full of stuff, you know? And when somebody comes up and says, I want to know this, they expect for me to give them an answer, just like a rigor is put on the spot. When somebody says, what about this? And you feel you have to give an answer, and you're supposed to know. But what if you're not quite sure? And that's common for me, mainly because I don't know why somebody would ask me that question. Especially you know, when you get the different versions of it. I know this canopy is highly elliptical, but is it truly elliptical? Um, basically, the question is, what is the difference between this and that type of plan form? And I can see the impatience when people come to me with that if they, quote, know who I am and they know what I've supposedly done, they expect I'm going to give them an answer that makes absolute sense from a technical standpoint for a question that, to me, I don't really know why they're asking. So stick with me here. I first try to find out why I would be asked something like that, and I basically assume that it's because they want to maybe change canopies or something, and I, so I say, what have you been jumping? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? And what do you want to achieve by changing canopies? And um, the answers tell me a lot about the person and, and how they see the world of skydiving, because I admit I see it a little strangely because of my background. Um, I've jumped a lot of parachutes that were really bad you know, to figure out how to make a good one. But every once in a while, I have somebody that tells me the facts of their situation. They're already impatient with me, and they say, look, this canopy that I have does everything I want, but I am going to be taking coaching and learning how to swoop. I need to change from my semi-elliptical to a fully elliptical canopy, because that's what you need to swoop. And I'm just thinking, OK, how do I handle this? Um, you know, Familiarity with your canopy is usually a good thing before you try something different. And so we go from there. Um, but the question really is, is, is wing plan form the big thing for performance? And to me, one of the major things is the area, of course, but people already decided what size they're supposed to get for whatever reason. Um, but do you, are you asking me because you expect I should know precisely what a particular plan form does or does not do? Um, I'm wondering if they want to know what it means technically. Or are they just referring to these customary names that we've adopted as a community 
as a way to describe kind of what sort of parachute we're flying and what sort of style we like. So basically, it's like, do you want me to fit this canopy into a tidy little box? This is this, this is that, you know, on the head, go away. And I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Because I feel like, for some reason, people will believe what I say way too uh, naively, and it might be inappropriate. I might lead them off with some conclusion that really had nothing to do with, with what I was in trying to get to. So why the emphasis on plan form names to perhaps totally define and classify canopy performance? Because there's a lot of different things that go into designing a canopy and also flying a canopy in a certain way. There's a lot of personal uh, likes and dislikes that some canopies you can accentuate your likes and desires, and then the, you, you can put up with the, the, the other stuff you don't like. And I, I think about, I would step back from things, and, and I, there's this quote by Stephen Hawking that I think really fits. Sometimes people just want to know a fact so that they can impress their friends or something. So this is it. The greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. And it sometimes put me on the spot where I feel like if I say something, they think I have some sort of credibility that makes it a fact and true, and it may not be that way. So with that in mind, let's look at a couple of basic terms. Plan form is the shape of the wing when viewed from directly from above. Or said another way, when you look up at your parachute, what you see is basically the plan form shape. That's different from what's called the anhedral arc. Some of you have heard about that. The anhedral arc is not the shape of the leading edge of the canopy. That's the front of the plan form. Anhedral arc is when the canopy's coming straight at you, hopefully from a safe distance, and you see the arc of the canopy that's formed by the lengths of the lines, and then the canopy's like this. Changing that arc is another design element. So it's, they're two separate things. Canopy plan form and canopy anhedral arc are two separate things. Airfoil is also not the same as plan form. Some people go, Wow, what a great airfoil, but you can't see it that way. If you were to imagine it was, uh, the, the uh, parachute was a cake and you sliced it from front to back and then you looked at the shape of the slice, that is the cross-sectional area from front to back, that's an airfoil. And it can vary along the canopy, both in size and in shape. One particular plan form is called elliptical. And if you were to go extremely technically specific on exactly what that is, it would be, and this is arguable, I, I do admit, it would be a plan form where the shape follow, the perimeter of the shape is exactly a geometric ellipse. Now there could be long skinny ones, short fat ones, but to the extreme, that's, that's what an elliptical plan form is. And if you deviate from that elliptical shape for any reason, usually good reasons by the way, that is called a semi-elliptical, technically. Now of course we all generically call it elliptical. There's something called the distribution of lift. If this podium is the wing, the center of the wing, the air flowing across it, is very efficient at developing lift. It separates the air above and below quite easily. But out at the wing tips, it's a little weird because the air that's underneath wants to flow over the top. And you get all this spanwise flow on the top surface and on the bottom. And when you think about a parachute, there are tubes of air. And the air kind of flops over it. It's not very efficient. So, Having a good distribution of lift helps to get more out of a given wing area. That's called spanwise lift. And, and to represent it, and the cordwise lift is front to back. Most of the lift comes from the front of the airfoil, but the whole airfoil needs to be there. You can't just chop off the back if it's, it doesn't work. So diagramic, 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 whatever. There's a picture of it, okay. <laughs> Spanwise lift distribution could be represented by that figure where the longer the line, the greater amount of the lift that is being generated is in that area. As you get to the tips, it finally falls off to zero when you hit the tip. And the other picture is cordwise lift distribution. There's eight different places on there, and you can see that the, the lines are longer in the front because that's where the lift typically comes. Now, not on all airplanes, but on parachutes, it really does need to come from up front. So just to cut to the chase, your parachute flies or the way you want or it doesn't fly the way you want because of everything about the parachute design and also has a lot to do with the way you're flying it, right? So you're flying a, a whole parachute to state the obvious and not a plan form. 
it really is funny when somebody comes back from jumping a parachute and they say, wow, I really like that plan form. You know, and I'm just thinking, I wish I knew how much of the design, uh, the results was due to that plan form and how many of the other thousands of things that went into it, but that's because I've dived into it too much. Same thing with the airfoil, I like that airfoil. You really are flying the whole parachute and the airfoil might be, you know, it might be an airfoil in a student canopy and you don't know it, but it's just all the rest of the things that make it different. Same thing with the idea of trim angle, how steep the canopy's pointed at the ground. Um, it is a design factor that's pretty important, but it's not that and that alone. So the whole of the parachute and you is much greater than the sum of its parts. Also, it's called planform, not platform. I know with computers, platform, and I think I'm standing on one, and politicians love to have some plan, platform to stand on. It's not a platform, so don't say you really like the way that platform says. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but it just sounds funny to me, um, unless you're flying one of these. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I want to fly one of those. It looks, looks a little bit sketchy. Here's the geometric ellipse equation, and you can put all whatever numbers you want into A and B, as long as A is bigger than B, and whatever. I'm not much into equations, and w despite what some people might think. But you can get a longer, skinnier ellipse, like a paraglider, or you can get more like, like what you see in skydiving canopies. And if you make A and B the same number, it's, it's a circle, it's not an ellipse. So the question is why, and this goes way back in aviation to the teens actually, as to why, because you can only build airplanes so fast, but you can talk about it with people who build airplanes endlessly. And so one of the things is that an elliptical spanwise lift distribution gives you the most lift, we'll say, and I'm speaking very non-technically, compared to the drag that comes from producing lift. The drag coming from lift is called induced drag. There's also parasitic drag, it's just skin friction and, and what have you. And truly elliptical wings, in theory, can achieve this very low uh, induced drag and, and an elliptical lift distribution. At, at, in theory, every angle of attack that it actually flies at, from the stall all the way to high speed. This is all stuff you read in books somewhere. And books, you know, you write a book and suddenly people think you know what you're doing, right? Other planforms can do this at some particular design flight regime, but everything else is a compromise and you have to kind of fiddle with it, other planforms. Um, you need to do things like uh, you know, twist the wing. Um, also, low aspect ratio wings are so much tip lossage that it actually approximates an ellipt elliptical lift distribution. This is all like technical college stuff and it's like, pff, throw it away. But when people wanna know the reason why elliptical in, in traditional aviation, that's why. Elliptical wings are very rare. It took me a long time to find a three view of, a, of an airplane that has a truly elliptical wing. This is a World War II Heinkel 70. It was a research plane. I think they were trying to make it uh, be some sort of whatever, fighter reconnaissance thing. But that thing was really, really fast for the power that it had and they pulled out the stops and did everything they possibly could to get it to fly like that. It was not produced in number because probably it was a really pain in the neck airplane to, uh, to, to pilot. So elliptical wings are troublesome. They're finicky, they're picky, truly elliptical wings. For one, they're difficult to design and build, especially if you're building an airplane. There's a lot of curves everywhere. Every piece is different, really difficult. But aerodynamically, they produce great lift right until the last minute and then suddenly it's like the wing disappeared. It just stall characteristics on typical airplanes that have a truly elliptical wing and there aren't many, just really bad. And of course, when you're landing, you get close to the stall speed and it would be nice if the, uh, the airplane handled and behaved more nicely. So uh, there's things people do, twisting the wing, changing airfoils from, root, from the center of the wing to the ends of the wing. But what they normally do is they modify the plan for them. They usually put a little more, if this again were the wing, they put a little more area out near the tips and then it behaves better. And that is called semi-elliptical. <laughs> okay, and again, we're speaking somewhat generically. There's one of the most beautiful airplanes I've ever seen. It happens to be British, as you know, the Spitfire. Um, it is considered an elliptical wing in a ge generic sense, but it's technically semi-elliptical because it's two half of, el of ellipses, the front ellipse being different than the rear. It's kind of like the it's a one-third, two-third split on the wing. It's just so beautiful, who cares, you know? But uh, 
Anyway, uh, there's also a little bit of extra wing area at the tip on some, elliptic, uh, on some Spitfires. They messed with the wing shape quite a bit through the history. Um, it's not new, as I said before. This is some guy who did a lot of theoretical work in 1918, Prandtl. And there's that one-third, two-third split elliptical shape. Back in the days when they were building airplanes with wood and wire and covering it with Irish linen or, or cotton and had engines that lasted maybe 20 or 30 hours with only a few engine failures. I don't know how many folks did it back then. Some people modify it simply by clipping the tips off of airplanes. By the way, it's easier to look at this stuff with airplanes because it's so concrete looking. Um, that actually is a home-built airplane that has a rectangular wing and the designer had to defend his choice practically to people and spend a lot of time doing it. It's a beautiful airplane. It's called an RV-4, but not with that wing. This is somebody's fantasy trying to mess with a good thing. And it was kind of an online thing. I thought it was interesting. But that also changes the area, the aspect ratio and everything else if you just hack it off. But there is one parachute company, uh, uh, Parachute Labs. They're known as Jump Shack. They build the racer container system, and they also build parachutes. And they really wanted to do this truly elliptical thing. So they started with this three to one ellipse, which isn't really diagrammed correctly there. And it was three to one aspect ratio. And then they truncated it by cutting off the tips. And that made a 2.65, which is a typical aspect ratio for a, a wing. And that makes it semi-elliptical to me, although I get what they're saying. I'm not trying to argue with anybody's uh, logic or or salesmanship on their wings. Um, the first elliptical canopy was the Blue Track, and that was launched in 1989, and it was quite a sensation. It was the first modern zero P canopy. Um, it was slightly tapered, but they called it elliptical, and when we think of an elliptical canopy, how they're, they're more agile and everything, that was it. That thing was just amazing, and they never told you what size it was. Uh, I'm not going to bastardize the French language uh, accent, but uh, they said, it is so fantastic that we shall not even speak of the wing area, but it's for experienced jumpers only. Of course, somebody who has 2,000 jumps on a parafoil may not be really prepared for something like this, but it was quite a sensation, very fast, flat glide, very, very uh, radical in its performance in its day. So I actually had a friend that had one in his closet, and I said, I really would like, since I'm doing this seminar on plan for him, to actually take some basic measurements. And as near as I can tell, measuring a finished canopy is a very crude way, but it's an approximation for this. That's a BT-50, and I measured it out to be roughly 135 square feet. And it's got a straight leading edge, it looks to anyway, and about the center cell and about half of each cell next to it was straight, and then the rest of it is just a nice taper on the trailing edge. Whatever, it was a cool canopy. There were other ones that came up, the Pintail by Pisa. Does anybody remember the Pintail? Anybody, any old timers? I gotta say, everybody was like, kinda like looking down their noses at that thing. I thought that was the coolest canopy. It was faster, steeper, and it had an airfoil and a few other things that gave it a very powerful flare. But apparently, from what I hear, I never jumped one, it was quite a handful on opening and it kinda made that one go away. I think that was really the direction it should have gone, but it kind of, there are folks that still love their pintails, and other ones, they do nothing but complain. Um, the Jonathan by a Brit, uh, Tony Irigallo, ran Airtime Designs, and uh, oh, that, that's not my phone, great. <laughs> so uh, anyway, he decided to get into parachutes because we were slow at getting on the elliptical kind of thing ourselves. Um, we were having a hard time building what people wanted, and, and we were researching but weren't satisfied. So that was, uh, that was a very exciting kind of, he did a lot of changes to the plan for him over the time he was building them. And then there was the stiletto from, from Performance Designs. Um, I can tell you, this is a very rough guess on the pintail plan for him. I do remember it came to a point, and it was very radically tapered, and that can make it more difficult to handle the openings. Um, again, that's just my guess. This is the, the stiletto plan form, and it's a little different. It was five cells in the center that were completely rectangular, and then a dramatic taper on the ends, uh, about twice as much on the trailing edge as the leading edge. And the reason for this was to kind of approximate crudely a more elliptical plan form, to make the center of the wing a little bit more efficient. 
in a crude way, and it's something that's also common in aviation, as I'll show you. This is the Jodel uh, Baby D9. It's a home-built airplane. There's actually quite a few in this country. It's a little tiny wood, lightly built wood and fabric covered airplane with a VW Beetle engine on the front. And I think they're just cool. I'd love to fly one. I'm a little bit big to get in one. But uh, you can see the center cell is, the center uh, area is straight and then the tips are sharply tapered. They're also twisted and a bunch of other stuff. But it's, it's a neat little airplane. This is a Cessna 182. I think a few of you guys are familiar with them. Notice the plan form, straight in the center, tapered on the ends. Much easier to build than an elliptical wing or a semi-elliptical wing when you make it fixed, but much easier to build because you've got a lot of straight lines, easier to do with metal. That airplane, people like to you know, say it's a pig or anything, but it's a wonderful airplane, 172, 182, 152. They go fairly fast considering what they're powered by and the room you have inside, and they land really slowly. It's a wonderful airplane. So let's go back to parachutes. Um, in, in the 80s, we put out the PD-9 cell. People liked it, and they got, uh, it, like, kind of, people thought they landed better, so they just went to a smaller size. I guess that's part of how we got where we're here. And then the Sabre 1 was designed to make, uh, it was called the Sabre at the time, but we usually refer to it as Sabre 1 now. It was designed to be um, easier to land, longer control range, more docile stall. And then we had the stiletto, which is, you know, okay, you asked for it, here you go. We thought we'd build a few hundred because a few cameramen would like playing with it, and we're still building them. I can't believe it, you know. <laughs> People still like that parachute and choose it for the particular characteristics that it has. But anyway, we needed to have a better novice canopy, and at that time, the Sabre was not considered a novice canopy. It was an experienced person only. Um, the PD was a good canopy, but by the time everybody was flying these smaller ZP canopies because they could, quote, get away with it, then people started thinking that the PD should be size smaller too, and it wasn't forgiving enough. So we wanted something that would be responsive and forgiving. We thought the Sabre was that. The market decided it was something that should be flown small, and it was exciting until the stiletto came out. But we wanted better landings, good flight at a light wing loading, Typically on a larger canopy, they're a little sluggish and we wanted it not to be sluggish. And more responsive than the Sabre at a, at, in a large size. The reason why people went smaller in some cases who are conservative is they said, yeah, it landed easily, but it felt very sluggish in turns, especially in deep breaks. And I'll get to why that is a little bit later. Uh, we wanted it to be easier to pack than a Sabre because at that time ZP was new and people were making a big mess of it, a real big mess of it. It invented the whole packer uh, industry though, you know, the main packing thing. And we wanted to basically start with a clean sheet, knowing what we know, but do whatever it takes. So this is an example of how Planform comes into a design, but not, uh, not like we don't set out saying, I'm gonna build a fully elliptical, blah, 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 blah. No, it's, it's like we wanna have a certain type of performance. So, we chose hybrid fabric so that the ZP on the top would keep good landings for a long time, but then the, the F-111 would make it easier to pack. We chose the Sabre airfoil because we knew that it was conservative and had a tremendous amount of power in the flare and uh, in comparison to the PD, and also it was very reluctant to stall in deep, in deep breaks. However, when you do that to a rectangular canopy, when you change from the PD airfoil to the Sabre airfoil, it becomes very sluggish in response. So one way you can fi fix that is to change the plan form, adding just a little bit of taper, whatever you need, wherever you need it, until you get the performance you want. So we, we played a lot with different uh, plan form shapes. Uh, there was a, something called the Easy Tandem at the time, and we just built an Easy Tandem, same airflow, by the way, in a smaller size. And it was really fun, but it felt too much like a stiletto. So we backed off on the plan form. We went a few times around and then eventually we had the silhouette. And that silhouette was also an influence on that navigator, which, which uh, is, is uh, gonna be discussed. The problem was at that time was, it may sound silly, but what do you call the plan form? It wasn't rectangular. Why not just call it elliptical? And uh, there was problems with that because in 1992, 93, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on in the drop zone. And people really felt like elliptical canopies meant, number one, it's super fast. Well, they're very small, okay? They felt 
that it was so quick on the toggle that if you pulled it too far, you'd get instant line twists. And you had to cut away from it, which was not something that was very common back then. Uh, erratic and demanding openings. I never expected that people would be cutting away from line twists on parachutes back when I started, but that was a thing. Everybody wanted to like diss the blue track when that was happening. I'm, I'm just saying I'm not joining that crowd. Like it's hard to get a parachute to open well uh, in design elements, you know. You know, I'm, it, it's just harder. You know, it's funny the way some people want to pitch one manufacturer up against another one and see the funny fight that happens. We actually get along quite well, <laughs> um, in spite of some people's intentions. <laughs> also, some of those canopies, they were so much smaller than people were used to, they found a little extra speed made it easier to land. They could have improved their personal performance. That ended up coming later. Basically, lots of accidents, and people thought, you know, no way am I going to jump an elliptical. They're crazy, or they're for crazy people. So in the in the early 90s, mid 90s, jumpers wanted, when they were talking about trying a new canopy, said, how about this one? They wanted our reassurance that it was not elliptical because they are not that kind of person. So it wasn't rectangular. Technically, in a generic sense, you could call it elliptical or semi-elliptical. What do we call it so that the people it was designed for would actually be willing to jump it? So we chose just not to even use the elliptical word. We said tapered because it is tapered, a little bit on the tips, right, here and there. And uh, marketing came up with something called Pro Taper, and what their idea was, we don't have to say what it is. It's an evolution based on our rapid design software where we keep changing all the things that we change in, in parachutes. It happens in minutes, and then we go build it, and we fly it, and we go, oh, let's try something else. We're not, we're not hung on that the next prototype is going to be the one. And it stood for performance resulting from optimal taper, da 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 da. And uh, that lasted maybe a month or two because people kept saying, but what is it? <laughs> well, it's whatever we came up with. Give me a name. So we said basically, okay, it's slightly tapered. What does that work? It kind of morphed to lightly tapered. Um, other companies came out with, you know, different companies see certain things in the marketplace and they see potentials and they all do it at different, they launch their products at different times, but Hopefully they're working on it and getting it sorted out before that. But uh, Parachutes de France came out with a canopy called the Merit. And it was, it, they talked basically about the performance of the canopy. It's pleasing flat glide, you know, peaceful going through the pastures, not too fast, easy to fly, easy to land, but responsive. Makes sense to me to tell people what it's supposed to do when it's loaded a certain way. Um, they did mention the word elliptical, but it was buried in the middle of all this beautiful language and it didn't really stick that much. I think they were basically saying, no, this one's not rectangular either. We, we are parachutes de France. Um, the silhouette and the navigator, which is our student canopy, was basically settled on lightly tapered. Now just think about it. In the world that everything was F-111 until you were really exp experienced and people were getting hurt on ellipticals, can you imagine what it would have been if we came out with a zero permeability, you know, ZP top skin elliptical student canopy? We would never be allowed on any of your drop zones. So we did that, gave a reason why. You know, it gives you a flare that's going to be more like what you would learn to have to learn on your own canopy, your modern canopy, but in a, in a size that is big enough that you get dirty rather than get hurt if you mess it up. And then the, 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 the ellipticalness, if you will, was there so that when you pulled the toggle down, it would actually respond. You've seen students when they're, or novices when they're in trouble and they just bury a toggle and then hurt themselves, and this was an idea that you could not have to use full toggle control. We also did the Spectre, which is not rectangular. We didn't even mention anything about plan form, but we just, it didn't turn in brakes the way we wanted, unless we made it a little bit elliptical. New Zealand Aerosports came out with the Sapphire, which we now think of as the Sapphire One, and it was advertised as lightly elliptical, sensible term. It was actually a much more aggressive canopy than the others. Um, it, it was more, uh, it was steeper and faster. They recommended a higher wing loading. It was, and it was all zero P. Um, but they were all considered conservative ellipticals. Now, I'm curious if anybody remembers, I doubt it, but it, because it was introduced in 1992, perhaps before some of you were born. Um, the original stiletto ad had words to describe the, the, the plan form, and we called it a 
double tapered semi-elliptical. And the reason we called it that is that that's what they call some of these airplanes that have that similar straight center tapered ends. Double tapered meaning on the front and the rear. And there's some companies make a big deal out of taper on the front of, of a non-rectangular canopy. It's marketing. But every one of our uh, non-rectangular canopies have had at least some taper on the leading edge, whatever worked for us. And to me, it's whatever it works, whatever works. And if you can describe how it flies, then you've, to me, we've met our goal. There was also the Sabre II after that, and the Sapphire II came out after the Sabre II. I think they felt that they could do better uh, in some aspects of performance. I personally think the, Sabre, the Sapphire II is a much better canopy than the original Sapphire. Um, I think the Sabre II is a better canopy than this, the original Sabre, although the world wasn't ready for the Sabre II in 1989, in my opinion. There's a lot of other ones that came out, and they all were defined by some sort of planform term. And the thing is, is, is that it wasn't just that the people in the marketing or the technical departments wanted that. People kept asking, well, what is it? Is it a this? Is it a that? So this gave a chance for some companies to try to create some uniqueness to say it's not like something else they've built or somebody else, and they came up with all these terms, fully elliptical truly, lightly truly, semi-elliptical tapered, constant cell aspect ratio is thrown around a bit. The point is, is that it created confusion because there was so much emphasis on it, not just because of marketing people, but because you were curious about it, it was still something new, that it seemed a lot more important than perhaps it was. Again, it is part of the design evolution, part of the thing that goes into the way a parachute flies, but it isn't totally defined by some name for a platform. So how about some clarity? The way I look at it is just go back to what a jumper wants, and you all want something different. But overall, there's certain things you want in different degrees. You want a certain type of handling, a certain amount of speed, and speed range so that you can land it or scare yourself going fast. You want uh, some responsiveness to the controls, enough to feel like you're, you're having fun, not so much that it makes you nervous. People call them twitchy canopies, and to me it's just too much sensitivity for where you're at at that point. You, you might want dive or not dive. Um, these things are different and unique for most skydivers. There's commonalities, of course. And there's six very basic things that a parachute designer will use to get in the, in the world of where you want to be. That, of course, is the area, the airfoil, the trim angle, how nose down it's trimmed, the aspect ratio, which is a fancy word for how long and skinny the wing is. You know, like gliders and sailplanes have very long, skinny wings. Those are high aspect ratio. Jet fighters are little stubby wings, low aspect ratio. The canopy anhedral arc, remember that's where the lines create a certain arc in the canopy when you see it from the front. And then the plan form, there's six of them. However, there's a bunch of magic stuff. And the magic stuff is where we spend a ton of time, years and years, trying to get just the right performance. And, and like, if you give me enough alcohol, I'll talk your head off about the crazy things, the crazy little things that make a huge difference in not only how a parachute flies, but even if it flies. Tiny little adjustments. It scares me when I see people cutting and hacking on parachutes to try to make them do different things. The point is, is that each of these design parameters influences how the other ones show up in the design. Any change of any one of those parameters affects how they all work together. So there's no one parameter that said, this thing does that. Sure, they might have a higher influence there, but you never change that one thing because you believe that will change one flight or opening thing without realizing there's going to be some other things. To isolate one parameter for discussion, therefore, is to make it almost meaningless. Okay, And I'll give you an example a little bit later. On to canopy plan forms uh, that are more modern. Um, this is just a high glide canopy we were building a few years ago. It was interesting and fun. Long, long parachute ride. The drop zone owner said, I do not like you flying these things. They're in the air way too long. I said, but I go away. I come back down low. I still don't like it. He was afraid that it would be something that would take the sport by storm, but I think paragliding is pretty cool. And it doesn't happen at drop zones. 
So our original idea when we started performance designs, I basically joined the company and doubled the workforce. I was person number two, at least the one that stayed. I don't know who else was there before me for the first two years, but Bill Coe, the founder, wanted to improve the aerodynamics of parachutes in a big way. He, and he thought that it, by enclosing the leading edge more, that you would have a more complete airfoil, you'd have more efficiency, and you could do all sorts of stuff. So he went right to the beginning uh, working on that idea and had something that in a scale model worked. And when I ran into him, he was ready to build the first one. And it basically involves a very highly tapered leading edge, like almost like a jet, like a delta jet, which aerodynamically doesn't make much sense for something that flies these speeds, but there was a reason why. And it was through a trick of internal compared to external pressure that he believed would help fill the nose out and not prevent it from caving in. He was actually right. Um, and uh, the only thing is, is that we couldn't really figure it out because the leakage out of normal F1 of fa F111 fabric would make it not happen, so we needed zero P. Well, it never stopped Bill Coe when he needed something and didn't have it. He'd do it himself. He, uh, we built this thing. Um, this is from 1985 when it was finally finished, but it, it is with a zero P fabric, and it has a completely enclosed nose with some, some inlets on the bottom. It's inflated with a fan just to see the, the basic shape. Um, we, we did that, the ZP with a laminated film, so it packed huge. Um, and of course, we're changing the, the shape, the plan form shape, really high leading edge taper. It does have a constant cell aspect ratio, but that's because when we were doing this all with, with uh, spreadsheets and bending rulers and making, you know, it was before all the computer stuff. And uh, just by scaling that cell down to the one that goes here and the one that goes there was easier, so we basically had a constant cell aspect ratio. It proved that this concept was viable but it just did not fly. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, wasn't something that was landable by any stretch of the imagination. We knew we needed more research and we kept going. But just a year later, we saw a paragliding magazine with this idea on the cover and it was a Brit that did it. And we we're like, ugh, somebody beat us to it. And, but we kept working, but then we saw that he patented it. Stephen Lingard is a well-known aerodynamicist. It's in uh, the, the proper parachutes, the you know, military stuff, and he patented it. Here's his patent, there's the parachute. You can see the, skull, the, the scoop at the bottom. And, it just, and then on the right-hand side at the top, that's the plan form, the view looking straight down or straight up at it. The leading edge is the sharply tapered side. And then on the figure three on the lower right, that's the anhedral arc, that's the view from the front, and it's there to show you the little scoop underneath. He had some success with this. I think it was used just uh, in unmanned applications, but we couldn't do it because there was a pattern. So we kept working on other stuff. Here's his claims, and it's exactly, exactly what we were thinking at the time or what Bill was thinking. I was just going nuts because I got to play with parachutes. I was having a good time, especially when I found out how crazy it was in terms of the way they flew. Um, so anyway, we kept, we kept building them even though we couldn't sell them because we knew we would learn something and it would go somewhere. Here's a 1990 prototype. I built, we built about six or seven, most of which didn't fly, and two of them, one of them I landed just once because it seemed like I could. It kind of seemed like a semi-inflated waterbed. It was really sketchy, but uh, this one flew really nice, really fun, um, except for the openings. Um, that's the plan form of it, and the entire leading edge was completely enclosed once it was inflated. For a 200 square foot canopy, it was very, very fast and a very flat glide and had a tremendous flare. But the openings were chiropractor afterwards for sure. So we were busy with other stuff by that time. Um, but anyway, what was happening when all this research was going on in the background was that parachutes got smaller, faster, and parachute pilots started getting better. So like we'd build a parachute that would scare us to release and then some people would get hurt, but some people would get better, and then that created an opportunity to bring something else out that required uh, uh, more uh, capability, but would offer more performance. And it's still doing that for not only us, but everybody. Um, but the canopies became a lot smaller, and when they're smaller, they're more responsive, even if it's the same design. And when made very small, these super tapered platforms, like I just showed the photos on, they were completely completely impossible to control. They were just all over the place. They'd, you'd start a turn, they just never stop, and just nuts, just completely nuts. 
So we thought at that time the parachute evolution has changed so much from what we originally thought that we should kind of blend some more conservative stuff in there. Less taper, more conventional in the center, and then put the more tapered tips on. We made some more prototypes over the years when we could. It was difficult because you guys liked what we were building and we hate letting you down when we can't deliver. So we had to hire people who really know how to run you know, manufacturing and teach them about parachutes. We ended up getting you know, almost 300 employees now. And it's, it's not easy to, to look you guys in the face when we're underperforming. <laughs> but anyway, um, at some point, this idea we saw in another patent in 19, it was a 1992 patent. We saw it uh, mid, uh, probably late 90s, and that kind of dashed our hopes again. It's another thing we can't build because of a patent. That's uh, Alec Puskas's patent, and it's kind of the this, this same idea on the leading edge. I'm not sure why it's at trailing edge, but it was along the same lines. Let's go to uh, current plan forms. This is uh, the Peregrine our canopy piloting canopy. This is the first version. It was our first canopy with this type of plan form. We're quite proud of it. There's actually the third version of it that's out on the market now. It was our, our first, but it wasn't the first on the market. That was the uh, New Zealand Aerosports Petra uh, canopy that is obviously very, very capable. Um, and uh, kudos to them for being the first with that style of plan form. Um, they were the first to market one, but they weren't the first parachute company to actually show one to us. Those were the ones that really dashed my hopes, and you'll never guess who it was. Parachutes to France again. The symposium in 2008, they closed the leading edge up of this prototype, cut the lines off, inflated it with a fan, and stuck it against the wall. And when I walked into this symposium at Barcelona, I went, oh. it's like, now I really have to do this, you know, really have to. Um, and they basically said, yeah, it's just a prototype, but it's just to show what's possible. And all of us sometimes show what's possible to one another in this community. That's why I love it. This type of plan form, though, has actually been in aviation for a while. There's a guy named Will Schumann who has uh, worked with gliders. And there's a really interesting article, this is it, you can find it online, where he talks about how the air going across the center of the airflow, remember the, the pressure distribution? There's some air going right next to it that has a pressure distribution that's a little different. It influences where the, the air wants to go on the top surface. Very, very non-technical explanation of why that happens. I mean, no math needed. And uh, it really talks about how to trick the air into being more linear across the top by changing the angle at the leading edge and not changing it so much at the trailing edge. And uh, these pictures all show things weird happening on the trailing edge of the wing. That's at the upper side of the drawings. And at the very bottom right, you see this interesting plan from with a straight uh, trailing edge and then a gradually increasing taper. Sound familiar? So we've got these things like our first tapered stuff and then the patent from Lingard, our blended approach because they were getting too wild, and then the Puskas patent. And then Parachutes to France drops that prototype right in front of us. And then Bill, uh, Will Schumann with this, this stuff. And I want to say, some people have told me that there was a patent on this, this type of platform. They're all expired. Will Schumann actually wanted to share this idea with people because he was an amateur aerodynamicist building wings for his experimental uh, sailplane. And he said, look, I, I've made some changes. I want to give it to the community and go see what happens. So he freely shared. That is the discus sailplane, the first one to use these concepts in an airplane specifically to, to make the flow more linear. The gliding people call that plan form a discus plan form. We like to call it, and others uh, like to call it the Schumann plan form just to give credit where credit's due. This is my favorite airplane with a Schumann plan form. It's called the Nemesis NXT. It's an experimental home-built airplane, retractable gear, and it goes over 400 miles an hour. It is so cool. And it takes a real pilot to fly it, but um, it's, it's gone throughout aviation. Yeah, there's a, a Dornier that flies into uh, Lukla at, in Everest that has that same wing plan form. And uh, it's, just, it's just something that it's one part of what can be done. So there's the Peregrine with the Schumann plan form. There's our Valkyrie, which is more of a normal high performance mainstream canopy. We have that with some stiff fabric in it. We're working on all kinds of new stuff 
in all areas from novice, intermediate, advanced, and super advanced pretty much at all times in our R&D. This is what I want to leave you with. Um, the competition velocity, if we go back to normal skydiver speak, people say that's fully elliptical. And if a young novice comes up and say, I want to fly a, a velocity, chances are you're probably going to say, look, it's zero P cross brace, fully elliptical, not for you. You need a semi-elliptical. And we, we know what we're trying to convince this person to do is to don't kill yourself. They, you might say you need something that is semi-elliptical, something more modern, more moderate for you, like, for example, a Sabre II. Well, that's the plan form for both the velocity and the competition velocity. There's actually three different plan forms on the small, medium, and large to make the smaller ones easier to fly and the bigger ones more responsive, just a little tidbit there. But that's the 120. There's a Sabre II. And of course, we know that it's semi-elliptical, but if you place them on top of one another, there is not a lot of difference, is there? That does not mean that there's not a lot of difference in the way a Sabre II 120 and a Velocity 120 flies, though. We all know that if you've ever uh, flown them. So that basically means that this whole hang-up about plan form, it depends on if you're trying to speak in a technical way about something that's truly meaningful or if we're just creating new nicknames for different categories of canopies. And that's pretty much what I think we've done. So I'm not bothered when somebody says, hey, I want to get a semi-elliptical this or that. I know what they mean. Or I want to get a fully elliptical. They want to go, they want something more. I don't get bothered by that. But when they want me to say precisely what that does, it does, it's part of the picture. And if you pull it out and talk about it alone, you're going to lead people astray. So in conclusion, canopy design or canopy piloting is a never-ending journey. It's been such a pleasure to play with this. I thought I was going to be a bus driver, well, an airline pilot. And I took a summer off of school uh, as I graduated and lived in my van and just started playing with parachutes. I was just going to do it for a little while, just like some of those guys that want to backpack Europe for the summer. And it, it just kind of never stopped for me. And it's been a great deal of fun. And it's been a great community to be a part of. But specifically here, plan form is infinitely variable, as are the other of these so-called big six design characters. There's infinite things. In our, in our design software, which we developed ourselves, there are 1,700 variables that we manipulate when we build different prototypes. Again, big six are these ones. And the magic stuff, most of the 1,700 variables are for the magic stuff. Each element affects the other, and they work together. And to isolate them out for a discussion makes the discussion, at best, purely academic, but not that meaningful if you're planning on going away with some sort of practical knowledge that's going to help make you fly a parachute or even choose a parachute more effectively. Planform does not alone define performance. It, it holds hands with all these other things. So don't take plan form terms too literally, in, at least in a technical sense. I want to give credit where credit's due. Um, parachutes to France for basically being willing to, to take a risk and put out something really different back uh, when the blue track came out. They wisely decided not to sell them in the States because they know there's lawyers there. Um, that actually probably helped us. <laughs> uh, New Zealand Aer Aerosports, who's always kind of been pushing the boundaries of sanity on what they uh, would put out and put. It's hard to put a parachute in a plastic bag and send it all over the, over the world. It's like, oh gosh, I hope these people take care. Um, Bill Coe, the founder of PD, and also uh, Stefan Lingard for looking way out there in the future and, and for uh, actually for Bill uh, letting me play with parachutes. We have no budget for R&D. We do whatever we want. He said it never stops no matter how hard it gets and it's, it's been really great. And then Will Schumann, who shared freely his idea on the Schumann plan, we, we call the Schumann plan form, which has obviously helped a lot in the parachute development too. Bottom line is that learning slows or it completely stops when we start thinking we're so smart. So you know, be careful of collecting facts that somebody who's an expert tells you is a fact rather than an opinion. Um, so plan form types as canopy classifications, I'm, I'm OK with it. Just don't, get, don't take it too literally and don't think it's that a technical understanding of these plan forms really helps much. So don't get hung up on the word salad or the techno babble, even mine. 
And I'll leave you with this. This guy, believe it or not, is a theologian. The weightier the words of academic birds, the less they fly. So I wanted intentionally to have this be not a technical seminar, but just to sprinkle a little bit of the crazy stuff we deal with when we're actually trying to make a parachute do something to the point where we feel it makes sense to introduce it to you guys as opposed to keep fiddling with it. Um, I don't want you to take my words too heavily or literally um, uh, because uh, I want you guys to fly. I want to fly too. So anyway, thank you. I don't know if we have any time. We don't. I'm a minute late. If you want questions, I'll go outside so we can get ready for the next speaker. Thank you.